And there was this idea we need a mechanical model of the ether. So you imagine, that, well, really, there's some medium. Like to have water waves, you got to have water, right? It's a, it's a wave in what? In water. Um, so people thought there must be a material medium. And then there's maybe stresses and strains in it or somehow vibrations in it or something like this. And so this thing was called the luminiferous ether. Luminiferous for, you know, to remind you of your Greek just means literally light bearing, right? Mm -hmm. the, oh, yeah. The, the, Fair. Yeah. Pharaoh is to bear, lumen. So the luminiferous ether was supposed to be this mechanical, physical, material medium that these electromagnetic waves were waves in. And especially the British scientists really wanted to build a mechanical model. That is, you just use Newtonian mechanics and you've got pulleys and gears and springs and God knows what. And you just, in your mind, I mean, it wasn't exactly serious physically, but just to make sense of it, can we build a mechanical model of the ether? They couldn't because it had to have funny properties. Right? Um, for example, you know, the, the tagline of alien is, of course, in space, nobody can hear you scream. <laughs> but they can see you scream, right? Why? I mean, we can't hear the sun. Why? Because there's no air between here and there. So you can't have sound waves reaching us from the sun. But we can see it. We can see the stars. We can see these. Th that means if these are waves and they're waves in a medium, the medium has to stretch. It has to be everywhere. Yeah. And so if you, in your mind, you're thinking, oh, this is kind of like sound waves or water waves, but it has this other kind of medium that these are waves in. But furthermore, here's the earth orbiting and somehow it orbits through this thing and doesn't get slowed down. There's no friction that you can see, right? I mean, you would expect if there was a medium and things were moving through it, there would be the normal effects of a medium. <laughs> So there was, there was that problem. Now, everybody knew that was a kind of theoretical problem. Again, that wasn't an empirical problem per se. But the, you know, one idea was if you just start where I was at, you say, well, gee, the, the Earth keeps, is orbiting, and there's no friction. Somehow it's able to go right through this medium. The way, I mean, people would often say uh, as if, the matter the earth is made out of was like a net with big holes in it. And the, the ether was so fine, it could just kind of pass through without dragging it. Um, that gave rise to the idea that there would be an ether wind. That is, if the, as the earth spins and also orbits, somehow if you could see the ether, you'd see we were moving through it at different rates. And we're then dragging it. Well, no, we, 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 on this theory, we're not dragging it with us. That's why there's a wind. Hmm. Right? And that was the basis of the Michelson Morley experiment. It was looking for evidence of this ether wind. Um, and they didn't find it. It was a beautiful experiment, um, a lovely experiment to describe. Ve highly, highly, highly sensitive to tiny little changes in the apparent speed of light without measuring the speed of light. I mean, it's, you know, it's a nice, again, conceptual thing that you can, you can check for small differences in the speed of light without measuring the speed of light. Anyway, they didn't find that, so the ether wind theory looked like it was in trouble, but no, people didn't give up. Then there was, to, to use the phrase you just used, then they said, well, it, it must be that the Earth is dragging the ether along with it and training it, right? The, the reason I thought it might have been a wind is I just imagine if we're dragging something, then if you're on the poles like if you if we're moving in the north direction if you're on the east west side of the earth you'd be feeling the ether dragging past you as if it were a wind that's just what was going on in yeah my yeah i mean there, there you know there's a question of you, you ought to be able to be in relative motion with respect to the medium and then things would look different just as if you're in relative i mean think about the water wave case the, the water wave is moving along and it really is as it were moving with respect to the water to the rest frame of the water you say, or take the speed of sound, right? So the speed, sound has a characteristic speed, Mach 1, in air at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, well, what's that speed relative to? What do you mean it has a speed? The answer is it's relative to the rest frame of the, of the air. 
It was a joke. I always tell this. I, I remember this. I thought it was funny when I was young on the show laughing. They had a funny little joke because it was the time when the uh, supersonic, the supersonic planes just started, the Concorde, right? So you could book a flight and, and go faster than the speed of sound. And they had a, they had a, a sketch where it's supposed to be the first flight of the, of the Concorde and you see all the people sitting in rows. And the, in the front row, one person turns to the other and says something, and then the <laughs> next row back they answer, and then the next row back they answer, because, gee, we're going faster than sound. And, you know, it was funny, and then you say, but that's not right. It wouldn't be like that. Why? Because you're dragging there, you're entraining the air, right? There's still, speed of sound is still Mach 1 in the plane, but relative to the rest frame of the air that's in the plane, so everything would seem normal, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so there was an ether drag theory that said, oh, that's why we're not seeing these differences in the speed of light in different directions on the Earth, because the ether is being dragged along with the Earth. So that would solve that problem. But of course, you solve one problem, you bring up another problem. Then you have to think, okay, I've got this ether, it's going along with the Earth. The ether outside the Earth isn't being dragged. So there's going to be these layers where there's the transition between the dragged ether and the non-dragged ether. And that should have optical effects. So you look for stellar aberration. You look at the star, you, you would think, oh, the apparent positions of stars will be different when they go through this kind of intermediate layer. They look for that, they didn't find it. And so the other thing is, if, if you have in your mind, uh, especially sound waves as your model for these electromagnetic waves, Sound waves are pressure waves, and, and the, the variation is in the direction of motion. So it's like the, the, the sound wave is going this way, and you'll see this variation of dense, less dense, dense, less dense, and you think about how that works, and it propagates along. But electromagnetic waves, the variations in the uh, electric and magnetic fields were at right angles. They're called transverse waves. So the, the electromagnetic wave is moving this way, and the electric and magnetic fields are, as it were, vibrating off in, in orthogonal directions in the usual way you present this. And, uh, and so there was a question, well, what kind of medium can do that? We understand the kind of medium like air. Water waves are really complicated because actually the water, even though the wave is doing this, the water is doing this, and it's actually doing little circles. I mean, it's a complicated story about water waves. But the waves they knew about and the media they knew about had different features than these electromagnetic waves. So this was, I wouldn't say a crisis. It's just the kind of thing that if you're curious, you're saying, that's interesting. I mean, I wonder how that works, right? I mean, it was just a puzzle. And that was the kind of thing Einstein was trying to get a clear picture in his head of electromagnetic theory. Anyway, Michelson Morley do this, sorry, Michelson Morley, I think I learned from you it was Michelson. Um, Nicholson Morley do this experiment and, and they get a null result. They don't notice any apparent changes in the, in the speed of uh, light. And the normal story is that's what was really bothering Einstein. He was explaining the outcome of that experiment. It was driven from that experiment. That's untrue. Um, what we, now there's been a little bit of a change. When I was in graduate school, the historians were saying, we don't even know he'd ever heard about the experiment. <laughs> Um, I, I said that on another podcast and then someone said, well, there's new evidence that he had heard of it anyway. <laughs> Glad somebody's working on the history of this so, so intently. Yeah. Um, but whatever that's true, if you just have to read the paper, the 1905 paper to see that wasn't the issue for Einstein, that that's to me is what's really interesting that most people don't understand because you just read the first paragraph. It's wonderfully clear. Um, and the title of the paper is on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. So you're talking about electromagnetic theory, and especially when you've got charged or magnetic bodies that are in motion and in motion with respect to each other. So here's the actual situation Einstein describes in great detail um, at the beginning of that paper. So this is what he was thinking about, according to him at the time. Uh, if I take a coil of wire, like copper wire, wrap it around and around and around, and then hook it up to an ammeter, which measures current, okay? 
and I now have a regular bar magnet, right, with a north and a south side. Here's an experiment you can do. It's very easy, and this is predicted by Maxwell's theory. Take the magnet and push it through the coil. And if you do that, you'll see a little bump that there'll be some current that will be induced. So this is induced electrical current. When you go this way, the current goes one direction. When you pull it the other way, the current goes the other direction. If you stick the magnet right in the middle and put it on a spindle and spin it, um, the current will go both ways. And now you have something that produces alternating current. And if you connect that up to a, a, a hydroelectric dam, I mean a dam with water going through and use the water to spin this thing, you now have a hydroelectric power plant. So, the, a, and the normal way you talk about that is you say, ah, that's because the magnetic field is changing. As I move, as I move the magnet through, the magnetic field around the coil changes. And by Maxwell's equation, a changing magnetic field induces an electric field. So that creates an electric field out here. And the electric field points, using the right hand rule, the electric field points around and sitting inside the wire, you've got all these nice free electrons, and, and they're affected by that electric field, and they're driven around, and that creates a current, right? Nice story. If I do it this way, it creates a, an electric field in the other direction, drives them around the other way. That's fine. Now Einstein says, now, let's do a different experiment, or what's that, what, what, let me put it this way, according to this theory is a different experiment. I'm not gonna move the magnet. I'm just gonna let the magnet sit here. I'm gonna move the coil. Really? That's a, that's, that's a different experiment? Yeah. Okay. Why? And this is, this is, if you just read the first paragraph of the paper, this is what Einstein's going on about. So I just hold the magnet and move the coil with the same relative speed. Well, now, because the magnet isn't moving, the magnetic field isn't changing. Because the magnetic field isn't changing, there is no electric field. Right? Well, if there's no electric field, why are you getting a current? Well, because there's this other thing called the electromagnetic force, and this is, you know, comes from an, another piece of Maxwell's equations. And it says if you have a charged particle moving through a magnetic field, that creates, directly creates a force on the particle, not by creating an electric field, but directly creates a force on the particle. And that force is just exactly enough, as you might imagine, to create exactly the same current. And if you do it this way, so they're both moving, then you've got kind of half the electric field and half the electromagnetic, uh, electromotive force, but they add up to the same thing. And you get exactly the same phenomena, right? Now, that is in fact what happens. So this is not, we did an experiment and it didn't come out the way we expected. What bothered Einstein was that the phenomena displayed a symmetry that the theoretical explanation didn't, right? The phenomena say, all I care about is the relative speeds of the coil and the magnet. Give me that and I'll tell you what the current will be. You don't have to specify this is moving and that's at rest or this is rest or they're both moving or whatever. But the theory said it makes all the difference in the world. And Einstein said, he said, when you move the magnet, according to the theory, you create this electric field. And the electric field even has an energy. So you'd have to say there's kind of energy content that's created out here. But if I hold the magnet and move the coil, I don't create an electric field. No energy created. So what bothered Einstein, and this makes sense for, again, this is a, a really smart guy who's just learned these theories and is trying to think them through and understand them. And he says, that, that doesn't seem right. If the phenomena are the same, shouldn't the explanation really be the same? Shouldn't the physical account of it? It's not impossible that two very different physical situations theoretically described create the same phenomena. That could happen. But he didn't like that. And so this is what was motivating him. It was a conceptual puzzle. A kind, I mean, you could say an aesthetic puzzle at a certain level or the idea that certain kinds of explanations, right? Again, I mean, the basic principle is symmetries in the phenomena ought to be mirrored by the same symmetries in the theoretical explanation. So that's what really bothered him.
And that's why the theory, you know, the theory was called on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Now, if you read the, the, the paper, which it's, it's not an intrinsically hard paper, but it's written in a very clunky way. As everybody said, Einstein actually wasn't a great mathematician. Everything's done in coordinate form and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it, it, on the face of it, it doesn't present itself as a revolutionary theory about the structure of space and time exactly. And the title of it, again, nothing about relativity, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. You can see why. That's the example. I've got some moving bodies, and they have electric and magnetic fields. Um, his math teacher, Minkowski, reads the paper. And Minkowski understands how to represent the paper, as it were, in terms of space-time geometry. And that's why we call it Minkowski space-time and not Einstein space-time. And it actually takes a little while for Einstein to accept this, because that wasn't how he was thinking about it. But eventually, he comes around and says, oh, yeah, um, really, what I'm doing is postulating a different space-time structure. <laughs>